You know, recently, my significant other pointed out a comment to me on the channel that said that I spent too much time doing my makeup. Excuse me. I am naturally this beautiful. Back to another episode of Lombardi Time Brews. I am your host, John Delray. Today we are going over Washington Commanders versus Green Bay Packers, the game happening Sunday in Washington. To be frank, this may be one of the shorter game previews we do this year because right now for both of these teams, there's just not a lot that we know. Washington is a team going through some changes, new quarterback, Green Bay, uh, we've spent a great amount of time talking about how much they need to change, and it sounds like a couple of those changes could be in the works. So, we don't know what these two teams could look like on Sunday. Will this be a great reset? We don't know. What we do know is that coming into this game, the Washington Commanders are 2-4 and four on the season. How they got there, they picked up a win against the Jags, loss against the Lions, loss against the Eagles, loss against the Cowboys, loss against the Titans, and then they picked up a win against the Bears. They're coached by Ron Rivera, who obviously spent a long time coaching Carolina. Uh, thus far in Washington, though, he's got a 16-23 and 23 cumulative record with one playoff appearance where they were bounced by Tom Brady's Buccaneers in his 2020 Super Bowl year. You know, looking back on last year to this year, Washington is a team that's gone through a number of changes. Uh, big addition for them is the swap out at quarterback, Carson Wentz being their brand new quarterback. But for the purposes of this game this weekend, it doesn't really matter. He's out. Beyond that, they also brought in Andrew Norwell, Trey Turner to help out on the offensive line. Part of the reason that they needed to do that was because one of their losses was Brandon Scherf, their very longtime offensive guard, who signed a free agent deal in Jacksonville. They also lost Landon Collins, depending on who you ask. A lot of Washington fans probably feel like that's not really a loss. But nonetheless, Landon Collins is gone. Defensive tackle Tim Settle's gone, as well as defensive lineman Matt Iadonis. And the funny thing about him is it's like he got released this last offseason on a cap-saving move. That guy, I swear, has been on the trade block in Madden, if you do franchise mode, for years. So Washington finally made the move to not have Matt Iadonis on the roster. Looking at Washington's draft, they did uh, draft a number of different positions. First round being Jahan Dotson, the wide receiver. Uh, so far off to a strong start on the season as Washington's wide receiver three. But it's possible that he won't play this weekend either as he has a questionable tag with a hamstring injury. They also have Fidelian Mathis, the defensive tackle. Brian Robeson, one of the best and most fascinating stories of the NFL season thus far, the running back. Percy Butler, the safety. Fifth round pick, Sam Howell. And then, of course, they did have some later round picks as well, none of which are massively contributing to the team. Looking at those draft picks, you know, Mathis hasn't done a whole ton for Washington this year yet, at least on the stat sheet. Brian Robeson mentioned a fascinating story with him. I think by now everyone probably knows it, but the guy was was shot during the preseason, and then he's back. I mean, he was shot multiple times, misses four games, and comes back and has been playing pretty well. He unseated Antonio Gibson as Washington's starting running back, which is a move that a lot of people expected. Um, but there he is running pretty well. Then you got Percy Butler at safety and Sam Hollow quarterback. And I've read some things, especially from Washington fans, seeming to believe that if Taylor Heineke really does not play well, do we see a Sam Howell appearance? It just doesn't feel to me that that's Ron Rivera's style, although who knows, in what is quickly becoming a lost season for the Washington Commanders. Speaking of the injury slate, uh, Green Bay, their injury report is out. They have three players out. Randall Cobb, totally expected. Christian Watson, still pretty expected, especially with him not practicing this week. And then Jake Hansen, offensive lineman. 
Uh, the fact that Cobb is not yet on IR, very positive thing. He, In fact, he just told Rob Domofsky earlier today that he believes his injury is two to six weeks with that high ankle sprain. Uh, when he first had the injury, he thought it, he heard it pop, which is, explains all of the tears and sadness that you saw from Cobb on the sideline. Uh, he thought he was done. He thought it was a broken angle or something, something tore. Uh, when in actuality, just a high ankle sprain, um, two to six weeks, we will see just how long it takes him back. But the fact that he hasn't been put on IR yet is a positive overall for the Packers. Same thing with Christian Watson and his hamstring. Matt LaFleur mentioned a little while back that IR was going to be an option for him, but they haven't opted to do that yet, which leads you to believe he may be back within four weeks. Jake Hansen with a biceps injury. I do have to believe that it's just a matter of time before he goes on IR. Generally, biceps injuries, if it's ruptured, uh, we're not going to be seeing him anytime soon at all. So, uh, And it's possible that they're just waiting to put him on IR until they have someone else that they want to put on that 53-man roster. And speaking of which... Sammy Watkins is eligible to come off the IR. He has practiced all week. Uh, however, he is not yet on the 53. When asked this morning about Sammy Watkins, Matt LaFleur said it's all very up in the air right now, but they are pleased with the way that Sammy has practiced. So, with Cobb and Watson out, Winfrey unable to be elevated anymore because he's already been elevated from the practice squad three times, getting Sammy Watkins would be a big move to have wide receiver depth against Washington. Uh, for Washington, their list is longer. Uh, Second-year wide receiver Diami Brown, he's out. Cornerback William Jackson, he's out, and that's a big deal for Green Bay's passing attack. Logan Thomas, tight end, is out. Uh, Carson Wentz, quarterback, out. Jonathan Williams, depth running back, out. And then they've got three guys questionable. Sam Cosme, the offensive tackle. Uh, John Bates, the depth tight end. And then, as I mentioned, first-round pick wide receiver Jahan Dotson is questionable as well. So, you know, like I said, there's just, there's a lot in this game that we just don't know. Washington moving on from Carson Wentz to Taylor Heineke. Heineke's a very different type of quarterback than Carson Wentz. And, and Heineke in his presser this week uh, with Washington's beat reporters even talked about how he's a different quarterback than he was last year when he started. Um, just a lot of questions, though. Like, what are we going to see from this Washington offense with Taylor Heineke at the helm? Obviously, last year is a good indicator. But are they going to try to run more the Carson Wentz style with Taylor Heineke? We don't know. One thing that we do know is that Heineke is relatively mobile. And that Green Bay, at times, struggles against mobile quarterbacks. Now, this is not Mike Vick in his prime back there, but nonetheless, he had 313 yards rushing last year. He is a very evasive scrambler, and he can move if he needs to. Something that Green Bay has to keep in mind of, especially when they're setting edges. This is not a quarterback that you can just send a million guys at because he's Tom Brady or Peyton Manning, and he's just going to be a statue back there. Heineke can move. And even then, last year, starting for Washington, Heineke had 20 touchdowns versus 15 interceptions and 3,400 yards. Uh, yeah, he's a flawed quarterback. He's an old gunslinger quarterback who's going to take a lot of chances. Doesn't mean that he's not completely capable, either. He is one of the better backups in the NFL. And the Packers can't take for granted the fact that they've already struggled against a few backups this year. Bailey Zappi coming to mind. So... Green Bay does have to be conscientious of Heineke. He does have enough weapons in his arsenal to still hurt the Packers' defense if they play cushion too much, if they get over-aggressive as well. The other thing that I'm really looking for in this game... Uh, oh, and actually, I'm going to backtrack just one second. Because in this same vein, Taylor Heineke, what's going to happen with the Green Bay secondary? Jerry Alexander was asked today if he would like to shadow Terry McLaurin. He basically said, yes, he would really enjoy that. Will he, though? We don't know. Jerry was also asked about uh, what his defensive scheme would be, and he, he mentioned that in Madden, he just blitzes everybody all the time. That might be the most Jair answer I've ever heard to anything ever. But I am also seeing the talk on Twitter is, is that his veiled shot at Joe Barry for not doing exotic enough blitzes. Maybe. But, nonetheless, what's going to happen with Jair this weekend? You know, if Jair follows around Terry McLaurin, does that mean Razul Douglas winds up with Curtis Samuel in the slot? 
because that's less than ideal. Curtis Samuel is Washington's leading target getter at this point in second in yards. Terry McLaurin is their leader in yards, and he still is the wide receiver one for Washington. Samuel has played better this year. He has contributed. But Washington is also a team that loves throwing to its running backs. Antonio Gibson, uh, J.D. McKissick. So Green Bay's secondary, is it going to be what we saw last week against the Jets? Is it going to take further steps back? You would hope not. You would hope to see what they're going to do again, what they did against the Jets. Number two thing that I'm looking for is Green Bay's offensive line. I know, everyone's talked about this a ton this week. But the truth is, the offensive line was a mess last week. And that's putting it mildly. Green Bay against Washington's front. The best facet of this Washington team, no doubt, is their defensive front. Jonathan Allen, to this point on the year, is 21 pressures. Deron Payne has 20. Montez Sweet, or Sweat, has 26 pressures, all according to PFF. That is one of the highest rates for three people on the defensive line in the NFL. The Washington Commanders also have one of the highest pressure rates when only sending four or fewer defenders in the NFL. And the reason is because they've got those three. And that doesn't even include Chase Young, who's hurt for them. My goodness. <laughs> like That defensive front for Washington on their line is no joke. Now, where they at times struggle, and again, at times, is defending the run. They've given up 131 yards a game on the ground thus far. Uh, that's one of the lower metrics in the, L in the NFL. It's not too far behind where Green Bay is, and we all know how bad Green Bay is at defending the run. But nonetheless, I mean, these three, if Green Bay's offense plays anything like they did against the Jets, Washington is going to maul them into the ground. So, Green Bay, what can they do with their offensive line? One, as I've said before, get Royce Newman out of there. Just get him out. I think Green Bay, I, I think they messed with him too much. I, I mentioned this earlier this week, the, the constant switching that they did with him in the spring and the summer between tackle and guard, looking to up his versatility. When he started last year, not even as that great of a guard to begin with. He just began to make progress at the end of the year, and the Packers seemed to take that progress and say, all right, now we're going to mess with you. He's just not good enough right now. So he's got to get out of the lineup. Now, does that mean you start Zach Tom at right guard? Does it mean that you kick Elton into right guard and then start Yash at right tackle if he's capable, which we still don't know if he can switch sides? You know, I've seen a lot of people calling for Jenkins to go to left guard and then kick John Runyon Jr. to right guard, and then Yash at right tackle. But Matt LaFleur, even earlier this week, said he wants, if he's going to make any switches, it's going to be the ones that make the least waves across the line, that he does want some kind of positional consistency. When John Runyon Jr. was just asked earlier today about if he'd rather play on the left or right, he said he'd rather stay at left guard. It's been the vast majority of his football career. He wants to stay put. And I agree. He has, for the most part, up until the Jets game, been playing a very good... He's been having a good season. He's been playing very well. And I don't feel the need to mess with that just to get Jenkins and Bakhtiari back next to each other. So, if you want to get Jenkins into guard because you think he's a better match there right now at this point in time with his recovery, by all means, do it. But I would say do it at the right guard side. Get Royce Newman out of the lineup, and then you kick in Jenkins to right guard. At right tackle, then you've got hopefully Yash, and if not Yash, then Zach Tom. He's realistically where we're going here. Now, if the Packers go a different direction and just bench Royce in the name of Zach Tom at right guard, keep Elton Jenkins at right tackle, it's still a move I can get behind, but I'm still going to be worried about that right tackle spot especially when Washington lines Montez Sweat up against Elton Jenkins. Sweat is fast. He is fast for an edge rusher. And where we've seen Elton Jenkins struggle since coming back and playing right tackle has been against faster defensers because he just doesn't seem to have the lateral quickness right now at this point in his recovery. It's not an indictment on Jenkins. It's not saying he's not any good. It's just saying where he is right now, the state of that knee cannot explode side to side like he needs to to play a really good right tackle. Okay, so kick him inside. 
move Yash to right tackle, do some chips, help out Yash on the right side. That, to me, is the best answer that they can do to counteract this Washington front. The other thing that I would say is... I want to see this game be the return of the Pony Package. I know Matt LaFleur has struggled with it this year. I know they've gotten away from it more and more. But get your best playmakers on the field. And even if A.J. Dillon is performing under expectations to this point, he very well may be one of them. As well as, that can help you in pass pro more than a fourth wide receiver can. Even in a lot of plays, more than Robert Tunyon can. So, um... I think that could be an ingredient to success. And Matt LaFleur, if you need advice on how to run the pony package, just call your brother. He seems to be doing it just fine with the Jets. Moving on to the last thing that I'm really looking for is what changes overall are coming to the Green Bay offense. Now, I know I did not talk about much the defensive side of the ball because I think that's not really the focus area. Green Bay's offense right now is very much in the spotlight, as it should be. It's been performing under expectation. So if you're Green Bay, are there things you can simplify? Dan Orlovsky has talked about this on ESPN. Uh, J.T. O'Sullivan with the QB School has talked about this uh, on his YouTube channel. Uh, there are things. Now, if you want to buy into the massive rift between Rodgers and LeFleur, that they're not on the same schematic wavelength, whatever, fine. I think that's overblown. But... There are small things in the offense that they can change to make more simple to set guys up for success. And as I mentioned, Sullivan, Orlovsky, it's been pointed out quite a bit from a number of different sources what they can do. One common theory that I see passed around a lot online is that Aaron Rodgers wants to return more to a West Coast style because that gives quarterbacks more autonomy versus the Shanahan tree style offense that doesn't grant a tremendous amount of autonomy because your job is to read and throw the ball. I could see it either way. Realistically, though, if this offense wants to get back to its 2020 self, and it may not have the ponies to do this, but if it wants to get back to its 2020 self, its near record-breaking offense, it's going to have to meld these two things again. Rodgers is going to have to start playing quicker and in tempo. He does not have Greg Jennings, Jordy Nelson, Donald Driver, uh, Devontae. He just doesn't have these superstars right now. And you can still win with who they have. That's the thing. But only if you're going to do it in the style that they can win in. And that's not just sending them on goes 40 yards out. You know, something has to give here. And I do think, even if Rodgers kind of plays more in that system, I do think that Matt LaFleur can get back to calling a simpler game plan. As I said in the Giants game, sometimes you just got to show up and show that you're better. And the Packers have not been willing to do that. They've been bending and they've been trying to... trying to find whatever the defense is doing. How do we exploit the defense? Just show up and show that you're better. Give the ball to Aaron Jones. I don't know what Aaron Jones did to make everybody angry, but it's got to be something. How do you get forgetting about that much when you're that good? I'll never understand it. But what changes are coming to Green Bay's offense? I do think this week I would be very surprised, very surprised, if the Packers don't make a number of changes on the offensive side of the ball. I think things will be a little simpler than what we've seen. I do think things will be a little quicker than what we've seen. You know, Curl, the safety for Washington, is having an absolutely fantastic season. But one guy who's not is their number one corner, Kendall Fuller. He has been struggling hard this season and has not been looking like a cornerback one. Pair that with William Jackson being out... Quick offense could work, especially against this defensive line. Get rid of that ball, move the ball, and get it to your best yak players. Aaron Jones, Romeo Dobbs, we know who these individuals are. If Sammy Watkins is back, his ability to help block will be very much appreciated because a very overlooked part of Sammy Watkins' game still is the fact that he is a very good run blocker for a wide receiver in the mold of Alan Lazard. So, changes are coming. I do believe this is the week. Changes are coming. And it better be this week, because after this week, the schedule gets a lot harder. But you are 
even this form of you, you are a better team than the Washington Commanders. Prove it. Call your game plan, stick to game plan, go out and prove it. My final prediction for this game is the Green Bay Packers are going to beat the Washington Commanders in Washington by a final score of 20 to 10. I don't think this is going to be an absolute onslaught. I think Green Bay is still going to be a flawed team coming out of this game, but this game at least gets them back on the winning track with steps across the board in the right direction. Thanks so much for joining me on another episode of Lombardi Time Brews. I do hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have an absolutely fantastic weekend. I hope, you know, if you saw him going around Twitter, the videos with Jair and Stokes dancing and everything, I hope your day is going as well and as fun as those guys were having at practice. As always, hope you're having a great day, great weekend, and go Pack Go.